All right, guys, this is the last chapter of Unit 3. So, Chapter 24, looking at nation building, economic transformation, and we're going to be looking at the Americas, um, which, if you can tell from my meme, which I find hilarious, um, we're going to be getting into the Civil War, but it's definitely not just North America. We're going to be looking at other places as well. So, let's get started. Okay, so let's look at independence in Latin America first, okay? And so let's look at the roots of revolution. Um, and so you had wealthy colonial residents of, of Latin America. They, they were really frustrated by the political and economic power of the colonial officials, uh, of colonial officials, and angered by high taxes, imperial monopolies, things like that. And so events in Europe ultimately cause a, a crisis to, to kind of take place that led to the colonial revolutions in Latin America. Um, for instance, the, the Portuguese royal family fled to Brazil where King John the uh, sixth maintained his court for over a decade there. Um, you had Napoleon's invasion of Portugal and Spain in 1807 and 1808 led to uh, many dissenters end up ending up in, in Venezuela, Mexico, and Bolivia where they overthrew Spanish colonial officials um, really in 1808, 1809, and then the Spanish authorities quickly reasserted control with a new round of revolutions in 1810. So you have a really like highly intense moment of, of uh, you know, back and forth power struggle and things like that. And so Napoleon's a part of that. Then you go down to Spanish South America, and so you had um, a Creole-led uh, revolutionary um, junta declared independence of, in Venezuela in 1811. Spanish authorities were able to uh, rally free blacks and slaves to defend the Spanish Empire because the junta's leaders were interested primarily in pursu per pursuing the interest of Creole landowners. And some people didn't like that. And this is where you see an individual that's pretty important in world history that you don't hear as much about. And it's funny because we have a town in Missouri named after him. And it's uh, uh, Simone Bol uh, Bolivier or Bolivar, if you're Missouri. Um, he emerged as a leader of the Venezuela revolutionaries. And Bolivar used his uh, used the, really the force of his personality to attract a lot of new allies. And this included slaves and free blacks and so to his cause and this you know really command loyalty of his troops um bolivar actually defeated the uh, spanish armies in 1824 uh, and then tried to forge venezuela colombia and ecuador into a single nation that was a failure but um as were a lot of his other attempts to create a confederation of, of former Spanish colonies. And because people, you know, realize that, you know, in Mexico, you know, Mexico, Central America, South America, like those are all different groups of people. So they don't necessarily want to be under one generalized uh, government. You see that a lot in, 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 in Europe as well, especially with the Baltic states. And so the same sort of feeling takes place here. Um, Buenos Aires was another important center for revolutionary activity in Spanish South America. In 1816, after Ferdinand uh, regained the Spanish throne, the local Junta leaders declared independence of the United Province of Rio de la Plata. This government was weak, and the region quickly descended into political chaos. But you see them, you know, trying to overcome some of their early. Uh, some of their early um, issues with with who was trying to really take charge and things like that. So let's move to Mexico now. Uh, in 1810, Mexico was Spain's richest and most populous colony, but the the native population of central Mexico had had suffered from dislocation due to mining, commercial enterprises. You had a cycle of crop failures and epidemics, and so uh, on September 16th. Um, 1810, you had a parish priest. Uh, his name was Miguel Hildago y um, Castilla. And he urged people to rise up against the Spanish authorities because he's he, he and others were just tired of, of all of really what the Spanish were doing to the, the culture of the country and things like that. 
And so uh, you, this resulted in a violent rebellion that took place under his leadership. Uh, and then Hildago, uh, he, he was actually captured and he was, uh, uh, he was captured and executed under a guy named Josea Maria Morales. Uh, Loyal's forces defeated the insurrection and executed Mor Morales in 1815. But in 1821, news of the military revolt in Spain inspired a guy by the name of Colonel Agustin de Intrube. Probably butchered that, but we'll go with it. And he declared Mexico's independence with himself emperor. In early 1823, the army overthrew Intrube, and Mexico then became a republic. So this guy, this, this colonel, ends up um, like establishing... Hey, now we're free. Nobody's over us. But then that wasn't good enough. And so they, then they overthrew him and became a republic. Now let's move further south, talk about Brazil. Uh, the, the, we just talked about King John VI of Portugal. Uh, he had ruled the kingdom uh, from Brazil until 1821 when unrest in Spain and Portugal led him to return to, to Portugal and Lisbon. King John's son, Pedro, remained in Brazil where he ruled uh, until 1822, when he declared Brazil to become an independent constitutional monarchy with himself as king. Um, he had a lot of liberal policies. Pedro had a lot of liberal policies, including opposition to slavery. Um, this alienated the political slave uh, slaveholding elites, uh, and really, because of that, he incurred heavy losses of men, money, uh, and things like that. And so you had street demonstrations, and, and because of the violence led to Pedro I to abdicate in favor of his son, Pedro II, who reigned until really the Republicans overthrew him. Um, Republican leaders, not, not like the political party, but the ones who wanted Republican government, uh, overthrew him in 1889. And so these are the different areas we're talking about. And if you look, Mexico is much larger than what we think of today. Um, we get in there to Gran Colombia, which was... Um, tried to be established, um, kind of that northern South America part. You see Brazil there, um, and then some of the other major countries. All right, so let's look at um, kind of some other constitutional experiments that took place over time. It says, leader in both the United States and in Latin America, um, they, they exposed uh, constitutionalism. In the United States, the colonists' prior experience with representative government contributed to the success of con constitutionalism. In Latin America, the inexperience with popular politics contributed to the failure of it. Um, in Canada, for instance, um, Britain responded to the demands of political form by establishing limited self-rule in some of these different provinces. And this happens really in the 1840s. And then around 1867, the provincial governments of Ontario, Quebec, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, they entered into the Confederation to form the Dominion of Canada, which, with a central government in Ottawa, which is really what we start to see Canada look like today. Uh, in Latin America, again, that lack of experience with elected legislatures and municipal governments, this led to, to drafters of constitutions to experiment with some untested and impractical political institutions. Uh, Latin American nations also found it difficult to define the political role of the church um, and to subordinate the army and, its, and, and really its prestigious leaders in a civilian government. And so I know that sounds like a lot, but really what you're seeing here is in North America. So the United States and Canada, we have had experience with constitutional governments, with, with voting and things like that. And so that's why it's successful. In Latin America, I mean, they were they were just colonies where the primarily the primary population was slaves like people weren't going there for for the same type of freedom that they came to north america and canada uh, and so they didn't quite have the same educated political background and and it really hurt um this is this is where historians point to that's why mexico's and and, and south america look the way they do today um, it is because of that lack of experience. And it's really just how they developed. And it's amazing to me with world history is that you can take something that we you, you may think is insignificant, but it's really because of that laid the foundation for why Latin America is the way it is and why North America is the way it is. 
And so let's move down to where it says personal leaders. Talk about Andrew Jackson, talk about Jose Antonio Perez. And so you had some successful military leaders in both the United States and, and in Latin America. And both were able to use their military reputations as really foundations of their political power. Um, Latin America's slow development of stable political institutions made personal politics m much more influential than it was in the United States. Uh, the first constitutions of nearly all American republics included a large number of poor citizens, f uh, really kept them from full pro political participation. This led to the lot rise of many populist leaders who, who really articulated the desires of the, of the excluded poor and, um, and who at the time used populist politics to determine constitutional order and move towards dictatorship. Andrew Jackson, the United States, Jose Antonio Perez in Venezuela are two examples of pop populist politicians who challenged the constitutional limits of their authority. Peyes declared Venezuela's independence from Bolivar's Gran Re Colombia in 1829 and ruled as president or dictator for the next 18 years. Um, Jackson was born from, he was born in very humble circumstances and was successful general who as president increased the powers of his presidency at the expense of Congress and the Supreme Court. And so you see both leaders in their own ways use their ability to and their background and their ability to connect with common people to really expand their power. You had uh, both men dominate national politics by identifying with common people, but really in practice they promoted their interests of the proper their interest in the interests of the property owners before anything, um, because they knew that's where the wealth was. Um, and that is what also helped keep them in power longer. It shows you um, the Dominion of Canada in 1873. A little bit of Canadian history there. Um, hasn't changed too much in terms of how they govern and things like that over time. Uh, this is what the United States looked like and kind of how it was built uh, over time as well with the Louisiana Purchase, Florida, excuse me, things like that. So let's talk about... Okay, sorry, I had to make sure I was in the right place. And so you had the thread of this, this this term called regionalism, like identifying with your region more than your country overall. Uh, and so after, uh, really after independence, relatively weak central governments of a few nations were um, often unable to prevent regional elites from leading these secessionist movements. And so this, we're going to talk about like the, the, the Civil War. Um, in Spanish America, all of the post-independence efforts to create large multi-state federations failed. Central America split off from Mexico in 1823 and then broke into five separate nations. Grand Colombia that, that Bolivar created broke into um, Venezuela, Colombia, Ecuador, and then Uruguay, Paraguay, and Bolivia declared their independence from Argentina. And so this regionalism idea threatened the United States as well with the issue of slavery, which divided the nation heavily. And people, are, you'll hear some people say uneducatedly that the, the Civil War is not about slavery. It, it actually kind of was. Um, you know, could you have it, could you not have it, things like that. And so this led to the establishment of the Confederacy and the Civil War because of it. Um, the, the Confederacy failed, historians have identified, for several reasons. Um, one was because of poor timing. The new states of the, the Western Hemisphere were, were most vulnerable during the first decades after independence. The Confederacy's attempt to succeed in the United States came when the national government was well established and had strengthened by experience, economic growth, and, and population growth. Um, the North did not have the manu or the North had the manufacturing hub, which is where a lot of the money for the United States came from. The South had cotton cotton and tobacco, and yeah, that was going to make you um, a decent amount of money, but it wasn't going to trickle to everybody, and you weren't going to get weapons out of it, and because of the blockade the North put on the South, they, they weren't able to get weapons from other places that were interested in a divided nation like Britain, um, and so this, there were several reasons that led to the Confederacy failing, 
um, over time. They were they were good at the beginning, but the, their weaknesses really came through. And so you have some foreign interventions uh, take place uh, during the 19th century's war between Western Hemisphere nations and invasions from European powers were often determined by national borders, access to natural resources, and control of markets. By the end of the 19th century, the United States, Brazil, Argentina, Chile had successfully waged wars against their neighbors and established themselves as regional leaders. Um, European military intervention included the British attack on the United States with the War of 1812, um, the United States War with Spain, the Spanish-American War 1898-1899, French and English blockades of Argentina, an English naval blockade of Brazil, um, the Spanish and French invasions of Mexico, uh, really, when the French invaded Mexico in 1862, they ousted President Benito Juarez and established Maximilian Habsburg as the emperor. Um, eventually, Juarez drove the French out and, and Maximilian was captured and executed. But it's still at this moment where you see foreign intervention really try to be pushed in these places and it fails. And it fails over and over again. Maybe not so much with the Spanish-American War, but that's a lot to do with just the Spanish being so backwards in their and their um and their fleet and their um navy things like that um the united states defeats mexico and forced the mexican government to give up texas new mexico arizona colorado uh, 1848 um chile defeated the cl uh, combined forces of peru and bolivia in two years uh and or sorry in two wars one was in uh, from 1836 to 39 the other one was 1879 1881 um, and because of that, Chile gained a lot of nitrate mines and forced B Bolivia to give up its only outlet to the sea. And so they were, you know, Bolivia was hurt and Chile was, was gained because of that. Um, Argentina and Brazil fought over Uruguay in the 1820s. Eventually they recognized Uruguay as, as independent and, and Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay then cooperated for a five-year war against Paraguay. So you have a lot of this back and forth. Um for a long time and really it, it was kind of some early imperialism taking place and trying to take place and you have natives what you know a lot of the natives were doing during this time um and so it says when the former colonies of the western hemisphere became independent the colonial powers ceased to play a role as mediator for and protector of the native peoples independent natives pose a significant challenge to new nations. Um, you, but native military resistance was overcome by North and South America in the end of the 1880s. And, and that's really you know, the removal of Indians and things like that. The United States' rapid expansion of white settlements between 1790 and 1810 that led to a lot of conflict between the American government and the native confederations, like the ones led like Tecumseh uh, and, and Prophet. Uh, this happens in 1811, 1812. Um, and then this is further takes place with the, with the white settlement and led to the Indian Removal Act of 1830, which is one of the most racist moments in the U.S. history, where essentially they forced the resettlement of Eastern Indian or Native peoples to west of the Mississippi River. You know, why Oklahoma was established. And, and again, this is just shows, you know, really the... So you've taken over, but you have a native population. What do you do with it? And so you see some, really one of the darkest, most racist moments in our history take place. Um, natives living on the plains became more skilled with the use of horses and firearms. Uh, eventually that became a real formidable resistance against the white, set, against the white settlement and, and, the, and the U.S. military. Um, horses and firearms made the plains people less reliant on agriculture and so more reliant on on buffalo hunting so you start to see them change because of that um but really the 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 buffalo was kind of a dying force because you had whites also going after that really for very small parts of the buffalo and so the near extinction of the buffalo loss of land ranchers loss of land and ranchers and nearly four decades of armed conflict um, I mean, the, the natives eventually just had to give up and, and go to the reservations because they had no other way. Um, and so, again, it shows, like, what do you do with the native people? And it's not always the right decision is made. Eventually, or not eventually, but you see this also take place in other places in the world. 
uh, in Mexico, plantation owners in the Yucatan Peninsula forced uh, Maya communities off their land and into poverty. Um, in 1847, the Mexican government was busy with its war with the United States. Mayan communities in the Yucatan Peninsula revolted with what's known as the caste war that nearly returned the Yucatan to the Maya rule, but ended up failing because the the technology ended up becoming um, too hard for them to handle. This is a great picture of some of the Navajo leaders trying to negotiate um, treaties for their people, and you still see a lot of those treaties in, in effect today. All right, so let's talk about the challenge of, of social and economic changes in the Americas. We're gonna start with the abol uh, abolition of slavery. Um, really in a lot of new nations, uh, it says the uh, rhetorical assertion of the universal ideals of freedom and citizenship really contrasted sharply with the fact that slavery was still around. And so, so slavery survived in much of the Western Hemisphere and really until the 1850s. It was strongest in those areas where the export plantation products was most important. Uh, so like our South and in the Caribbean and things like that. In the 19th century, slavery was weakened by the abolition of some of the northern states in the United States. Um, by the termination of African slave trade in the United States, which, hap which actually happens in 1808, so no longer slave trading in 1808. Um, this freed tens of thousands of slaves who joined the revolutionary armies in the Spanish American republics. But really at the same time, it increased the international demand for plantation products. And the first half of the 19th century led to increased imports of slaves in Brazil and Cuba. In the United States, um, abolitionists made really moral and religious arguments against slavery. Two groups denied full citizens under the Constitution were women and free and free African Americans. Uh, they played important roles roles in the abolition and movement. Even though a lot of abolition leaders did not agree with the women's suffrage movement, that was kind of taking place parallel with them, um, which is kind of an interesting concept. Uh, eventually, the Emancipation Procl Proclamation ended slavery in the rebel states, um, not occupied the Union, not occupied by the Union Army, really. But the final abolition was accomplished with the passage of the Thirteenth Amendment to the Constitution in 1865. Really, what a lot of people consider Lincoln's like uh, crowning achievement uh, in Brazil. Progress towards abolition was slower because. Um, and, and because of the pressure from the British, um, the heroism of former slaves who joined the Bra Brazilian Army of the War against Paraguay helped feed abolitionist sent sentiment and eventually um, led to ad the abolition of slavery in 1888. Uh, Caribbean colonies were, um, there was little support for abolition among whites or among free blacks. Um, abolition of British Caribbean colonies was a result of government decisions made in the context of declining profitability of the sugar plantations of the West Indies, while abolition in the French colonies followed with the overthrow of the government of Louis Philippe. Slavery was abolished in Puerto Rico in 1873 and in Cuba in 1886. Let's talk about immigration. And so as slavery ended, immigration from Europe and Asia actually increased. Uh, during the 19th century, Europe provided a majority of immigrants to the Western Hemisphere, while Asian immigrants increased after 1850. Uh, immigration brought many economic benefits, but a lot of hostility as well because you have so many cultures trying to mesh all at once. Um, Asian immigrants faced discrimination and violence in the United States, Canada, Peru, Mexico, Cuba. Immigrants from Europe countries face prejudice and discrimination, but not to the extent, and a lot of that has to do with simply look. Um, so the desire to sustain a common citizenship inspired a number of policies that aimed to compel immigrants to assimilate. And really you see this take place in schools. Um, they were trying to inoculate uh, or in inculcate um, language, cultural values, patriotism. All right, so we're getting close, guys. Hang with me here. Um, American cultures uh, developed also over time, but you see uh, this happen a number of different ways. Um, really, despite discrimination, immigrants altered the policies of many of the hemisphere's nations, and they sought to influence government policies. Um, 
you saw the, these cultures develop um, because of things like language, language arts, music, uh, political cultures, things like that all help develop what we see as American cultures. Um, women's rights, uh, struggle for social justice, again, another slow moment. Uh, in the second half of the 19th century, women's rights movements made slow progress towards the achievement of economic, legal, political, and educational equality in the United States, um, as well as Canada and Latin America. Most working class women played no role in the women's rights movements. Um, nonetheless, some economic circumstances forced working class women to take jobs outside the home, thus help them contribute to the transformation of gender relations. Basically, they weren't actively in the, in, the, in the women's rights movement, but because they were working, they were kind of in a roundabout way showing um, that they can actually do the same things. Um, despite the abolition of slavery, various forms of discrimination against persons of African descent really remain throughout the Western Hemisphere at the end of the century. It tends to overturn racist stereotypes and to celebrate black culture achievements and political and literary magazines failed to end racial discrimination. Successful men, women, men and women of, of mixed ethnicity in Latin America face less discrimination than those in the United States, but they still face discrimination. All right, so I believe this is the last thing that we're looking at is development, underdevelopment, and then altered environments. Um, nearly all the nations of the Western Hemisphere experienced economic growth during the 19th century, but the United States was the only one to truly industrialize, and that's an important point there. Um, only the United States, Canada, and Argentina attained living standards similar to those in Western Europe. Um, you had a rise in demand of mine products that led to mining boom, booms in the Western United States, Mexico, Chile, heavily capitalized European and North American corporations played a significant role in developing the mining enterprises in Latin America. And um, because of this, you saw the increase of technology and communication, stuff like that happen only in certain places. Um, Latin America, United States, and Canada all participated in increasingly integrated world markets. But interdependence and competition produced, produced deep structural differences between the Western Hemisphere economies. Those nations that industrialized achieved prosperity and development. Those that depended on the export of raw materials and low-wage wage industries experienced underdevelopment. Uh, you had some of these cyclical swings in the international markets, particularly to explain why Canada and the United States achieved development while Latin America remained underdeveloped. Both the United States and Canada gained independence during the periods of global economic expansion. Latin American countries gained independence in the 1820s when the global economy was contracting. Weak governments, political instability, and in some cases, civil war slowed Latin American development. And so Latin America became dependent on Britain and later the United States for really everything from you know, technology to capital. And then you also see some altered environments take place. Population growth, economic expansion, the introduction of new plants and animals brought about deforestation, soil exhaustion and erosion. Rapid urbanization um, put a strain on the water delivery systems and sewage and garbage and, and disposal systems really led to this, uh, the, the spread of the timber industry, the expansion of the mining in the United States, in the United States, the expansion of the mining industry led to the erosion and pollution in the United States, Chile, and Brazil. Really, people are faced with a choice between protecting the environment or achieving economic growth, and so economic growth, money, money is talks. Um, okay, so I know this chapter was, was kind of different. It's going through a lot of like, um, you know, why did... North America, United States, Canada, industrialize. Why didn't Latin America industrialize? Why why was this one successful? Wasn't it successful? So, as you're going through this, make sure if you have to listen to it again, you're looking at it through that lens. Okay, and as.